Sometimes we hate mercy. Now, don't get me wrong, most of the time, we love mercy. We love when the cop lets us go free when we know we have been caught speeding. We love when our spouse lets us off the hook when we know that their expectations were missed. And we are thankful, even grateful sometimes, when we get to give money to those who are in need. But other times, other times we hate mercy. We hate having to tell our kids over and over again to stop doing that thing. We hate that we have lent money out to somebody who asked for it and they have said nothing about it, they have given nothing back. And we hate having to forgive someone who has deeply wounded us, especially when they haven't asked for it. You see, the truth is sometimes we hate mercy because it feels a lot like injustice. Are we supposed to just forget about our experience? Are we just supposed to forget about the hurt, the the moments we were taken advantage of? Do you wanna know? Welcome to the book of Jonah. My name is Elijah Daly, and over the course of the next four sessions, we're going to unpack this book together. We're going to look at this book and all that Jonah has to say about mercy and justice. And one of the things I love about this book is that Jonah is not your typical prophet. He is a reluctant mouthpiece for God. And he shows who God is, not by the words that he says, but by his very life. In fact, Jonah really doesn't preach much at all in this book, if you can even call it that. You see, all in all, there are 48 verses that comprise the book of Jonah. And within these 48 verses, only two characters are mentioned, Jonah and God. And the truth is, we really don't know who wrote it. The book of Jonah contains no explicit reference to an author or to when this happened. In fact, if it weren't for 2 Kings 14.25, we would almost know nothing about the historical situation or the prophet. And even 2 Kings really doesn't tell us much at all. Jonah is really mentioned in passing. In fact, listen to what it says. It says this in verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. That's it. That's all we have. We wouldn't hear another thing of Jonah until this book. And believe it or not, most people, they don't love this story. They either see it as a child's story or they see it as too extravagant, too miraculous to really be considered true. And there's a lot of debate, really, whether this story happened at all. Some people, they consider it an allegory. Some others see it as a commentary that some rabbis put together to to address some other Old Testament books that had been written. And some even think it's just a parable. The truth is, I don't think any of these ideas are mutually exclusive to the fact that these things might have actually happened. And the truth is, I believe that there's the most evidence to suggest that, in fact, they have. And the primary evidence that I just want to bring up, because I think it's the most important, is that it seems as though Jesus saw this as a really historical story that happened. He mentions it in Matthew 12, 38 through 41. I want to read that for you. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, Something greater than Jonah is here. This account is paralleled in Luke, and Matthew reaffirms it again in Matthew 16 when he says that Jesus says that no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. And if Jesus thinks that this story really happened, it would seem to reason that we should too. The reality is that most people doubt the story because they see these claims as too miraculous. The fact that the natural could be interrupted by something outside of itself seems too extravagant. But isn't this Jesus' point? 
in teaching these things, that these same miraculous events that happened in the life of Jonah will be done again in Jesus' own death and resurrection. And if we don't believe that, then our faith is meaningless. His death and resurrection provide something for us that truly is outside of what we can truly comprehend. And so throughout this book, we're gonna treat it as history, but also acknowledging that God wanted this event recorded because it teaches us so much. It teaches us a great deal. And so let's jump into verse one and two, looking at the book of Jonah. It says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. In these first two verses, we get the entire context for this book. Both characters are mentioned, Jonah, the son of Amittai, and the Lord. And if you remember, every time we see the Lord in all capitals, it is called a tetragrammaton, which is essentially just a fancy way of saying four written letters. You see, the Jews, they would try to preserve and revere the holy name of God. And so they wouldn't say it. They would exchange his name when they were speaking about him with the word Lord. And when they were writing it, they would write four consonants, four consonants, and then they would leave out the vowels. That's why there's such a debate whether it's pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. But the point is that this name is present here in this verse, that they wanna make sure we are aware that although they're trying to protect it, it's important to establish the fact that the God that they're referring to is Yahweh. Because names are so important, they're so meaningful. This is the identity of God. This wrapped up within it is all of the history, all the things he has done. He's the deliverer, he's the creator. This is the God of Israel, the covenant God. And this can't be understated. Names are so significant. Whenever you meet someone and you greet them, right, you begin to know and familiar, familiarize yourself with that person, with their name, with who they are. And if I don't know your name, it's because I really don't know you very well. Can you imagine if I came up to you and I said, hello, my name's Elijah Daly and this is my wife and her name is, uh, uh, shoot, what's your name? You know, like, can you imagine that moment? What would happen? What would happen to me, right? Because names mean something. And the more that you know a name, you know that person, you know their identity, you know their story, and that becomes more and more significant the more that that relationship truly deepens. And here's the point of it all. This is Yahweh, the covenant God, and he is speaking to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Even here, Jonah's name matters. It's why this prophet was mentioned in 2 Kings. His identity is wrapped up into the story, and, and the fact that he's the son of a father, his, his name means something, and God's sending him, and this is what he's sending him to do. He's sending him a word to go to Nineveh, call out against it, because its evil has become such a stench that it has risen to heaven itself. Now, what is Nineveh? Nineveh was just a giant city in, in Assyria at this time. It was influential. And it was located in what would now be modern-day Iraq, about 500 miles from Palestine. And it was becoming more and more of a problem for Israel. In fact, it was, it's been mentioned throughout many of our Old Testament book. We see it on Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah. All of these books speak of Assyria. And they are all written at different time periods. And the relationship with Israel changes throughout. Initially, it was just a friendly relationship. Israel was accepting support from Israel or from Assyria, but then they start accepting their gods. And eventually, as time grew on, Israel would try to revolt to abandon that relationship and Assyria would crush them. Now, God sends a word to Jonah to go to this city, to go to the city and tell them how evil they have become that they have been known by the Almighty God, that the, that the stench of their evil has risen and met his nostrils. And what he says is that you must go and tell them that if they don't repent, they will die. And this is a helpful reminder for us. There are so many people in the world who are ignorant of God, but he is not ignorant of them. There is not a moment that passes where he does not know what's going on, and he is not aware and attentive to the condition of our hearts. And Jonah has been commissioned to go and address this issue. 
that Nineveh might see what they are becoming. But listen to what Jonah does next. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. You see, Jonah hears the word of God come to him and he runs. Instead of taking the 500-mile journey to Nineveh, Jonah went to the nearest town with a port, Joppa, and he left and went to Tarshish. Now, the truth is, we don't know where Tarshish is. Most people, scholars, believe that it actually just means out into the open sea. And what this means is Jonah's just not running to somewhere. He's simply just running from somewhere. He's trying to get as far away as he can in the opposite direction of where God has called him. And so he found a ship that was heading into the open sea. He paid the fare and he went aboard. It seems like madness, doesn't it? That we have a prophet of God who has just heard God's revelation to him, heard his word, heard his commission. He knows that that covenant name, Yahweh, all the beauty and the power and the glory that is wrapped up within it. But for the first time in scripture, this prophet of Israel is being deliberately disobedient. He just experienced the presence of the Lord. Now he's trying to abandon it. So much so that he just wanted to get out into the sea. In fact, many believe that the language used here of Jonah paying the fare wasn't just buying a ticket, but actually hiring the entire vessel for himself. Why? Why would Jonah do this? Was it fear? Fear of the empire? Fear of what they would do to him? No. It's because sometimes, sometimes we hate mercy Sometimes mercy feels like injustice. Jonah knew God didn't want to just warn them of impending wrath, but offer them mercy. It was implied in the very beginning. If God just wanted them wiped out, he simply would have just done it. Jonah knew. Jonah, as being on the side of Israel, on the side of these warnings before, knew that God wanted to give them warnings to help them escape from death not to arrogantly plunge them deeper into it. This is the point. The word of God revealing itself, even in the beginning, was simply an act of mercy. And so Jonah ran because he knew how much more mercy would God be willing to offer. Jonah's hatred of his enemies was greater than his love for his God. And so Jonah decided if God wanted this done, he'd have to find someone else to do it. He figured he could remove himself from the situation. Someone else can be in charge of this. Unfortunately, the truth is this posture of evangelism is running rampant right now. You see, a new word has revealed itself from God, Jesus. Jesus is the new good news that we proclaim, that we herald, that we announce. Jesus is the warning and the mercy of God that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. We've, won't, we've, we've often you know, neglected our friends with this gospel, with this good news, with this mercy, and even more so our enemies. Why? Because we've been so concerned with our personal holiness that we fail to mention the availability of our personal God. Or even worse than that, we've become so disenchanted, so frustrated, so irritated with those around us who, who, don't agree, who we don't agree with that we'd rather see God's vengeance upon them than God's love. There is a world on a path toward destruction, and we often pass by it because of fear or inconvenience or flat-out self-righteousness. Sometimes we hate mercy. In this case, Jonah did. But it's hard to outrun the mercy of God. And next week, we'll see just how far that mercy will pursue. See you next time.